right, guys. Well, so yeah, so it's about time to get started. I think we will. So welcome. I'm Damon Collingsworth. I'm the owner here at California Carnivores. Uh, California Carnivores is the largest, most famous carnivorous plant nursery in the world, probably. I'd like to be proven wrong. <laughs> well, maybe not. Uh, so we house a huge collection of carnivorous plants here. Um, we have been open to the public for the last 30 years, but now because of coronavirus for the first time ever, we're actually not open to the public. Um, we are still shipping mail orders, so if you guys want to order carnivorous plants when you're done with this and uh, try something new, since I know you're all stuck at home, lots of time to go play in the play outside, uh, you can uh, order carnivorous plants in pots uh, at californiacarnivores.com. And we're still shipping as fast as we can. We're a little um, behind. And then also, if you guys are interested in learning more, about carnivorous plants when this is done. This is our book, The Savage Garden. It's the award-winning, best-selling book on carnivorous plants and how to grow them. My business par partner, um, Peter D'Amato, wrote this and I did all the pictures. Um, but people really super like it. And so if you want to learn more when we're all done about this, you can, uh, you can order that on, you know, you can order autograph copies here or also on Amazon. Um, we sell carnivorous plants, well, Conservation is really important to us. So we keep the carnivorous plant collection here because lots of them are being wiped out in the wild. Uh, and then we also sell carnivorous plants because poaching, that is stealing carnivorous plants from the wild, that is another reason they're going extinct. And so we also sell them to people. And that makes it, um, you know, most people aren't gonna go fly, fly to, um, you know, Borneo to go steal a plant if they could buy it from us for not that much money. So that's uh, that's one of the ways we try to help um, in doing what we do. And I've done this for 30 years. I started growing carnivorous plants when I was 11 years old. A sticky cape sundew, we're going to learn about those today, uh, was my very first plant. Um, and I still have that plant actually. So you can have your plants uh, basically forever. Plants don't necessarily age the way animals or people do. So I've had plants. Um, uh, basically my same carnivorous plant since I was like 11, 12 years old. I'm 42 now, which means that lots of my stuff is now 30 years old. Oh my God. Um, so that's me. That's the place a little bit. Let's talk about carnivorous plants. Okay. So I usually start with like, what is a carnivorous plant, right? So like what makes a plant carnivorous? What makes it different from a normal plant? So Normal plants get all of their uh, all their food, their fertilizer, and um, which is plant food, they get that from the soil. Uh, carnivorous plants grow in areas where there is no um, there is no nutrition in the soil for them, so there's no fertilizer for them in the soil. So they had to trap uh, prey in order to catch their fertilizer, and that's why they evolved to do that. So all carnivorous plants photosynthesize from the sun, that is make sugar from the sun, and that's how they get their sugars. So they're not trying to catch like we eat for sugar and protein and fats and carnivorous plants don't eat for that. They eat just for their fertilizer and they get their sugars from the sun, just like normal plants do. And then um, all carnivorous plants have uh, flowers too. You're gonna see some of them today. Um, there's a little, Venus flytrap flower there. But um, so all the different types of traps that we're going to see, as beautiful as they are, are all modified leaves. There are no trapping flowers. Flowers are used to make baby plants, and so that's what they use those for. But all carnivorous plants have flowers and seeds, just like normal plants do. So in order to be carnivorous, you have to do four things. The first thing you have to do is lure the bugs in somehow. So most of them use uh, a sweet nectar. So nectar is like sugar that plants make um, and they have it all over their leaves or traps. And that's usually what draws in the insects because like ants and yellow jackets and moths 
and uh, all kinds of bugs, flies as we know, all kinds of bugs like to eat sticky sweet sugar. And so lots of them use those to lure them to the traps themselves. Also bright colors. So if you see all the plants behind me and some of these plants here, you can see really quickly there's a lot of bright colors. They're like usually dark red or white or yellow, bright, bright colors that'll stand out from all the normal plants and make the bugs come to them. So once they get lured in somehow, the second thing they have to do is kind of obvious, but we have to say it. The second thing they have to do is trap. So there's a Venus flytrap right here and those snap shut, but there are also sticky plants, um, sticky flypaper plants where things get stuck on the leaves and they can't get off. So sundews and butterworts. There's also rainbow plants and dewy pines. Those are all sticky plants where they get stuck on the leaves and can't get away. And then there are a lot of what we call pitcher plants, like pitcher of water. So those are plants like this purple pitcher plant here that have leaves that hold uh, liquid and that, like pitfall traps where things fall inside and they can't get out and they get digested inside there. So um, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of pitcher plants. There are American pitcher plants like this one here. There are tropical pitcher plants behind me. There's even Australian pitcher plants. In California, we have a really weird one that we're gonna learn about. And there's even uh, sun pitchers in South America. So there's lots of different kinds of pitcher plants. There's even another trapping mechanism that we're gonna learn about that's even faster and weirder than that. But we're gonna learn about that a little bit later. So once they're trapped, the third thing they have to do to count as carnivorous is they actually have to digest. So they use acids and enzymes, just like it's inside our stomach, to break down what they've caught into the fertilizer that they need. So we usually think as animals is only doing digesting, but all of these plants actually digest very similar way to the same way that um, we do. And then once they've caught, once they've caught something, once they've digested it, the last thing that they have to do is suck up that fertilizer directly into the leaf. So if you look at home, sometimes you'll see potato, uh, like uh, tomato plants or petunias, tobacco plants even, are covered in little sticky hairs, just like a sundew is. But we don't count those as carnivorous, even though bugs sometimes get stuck in there, because they're not digesting and there is no sucking up the fertilizer. Those are just little defensive hairs to protect the leaves and flowers of normal plants, but we don't count that as carnivorous. So that's uh, what makes a plant carnivorous. And there are actually 800 different species of carnivorous plants. You probably know about the Venus flytrap, that's one species of carnivorous plant, but there are actually 800 different species in the wild, and we're going to learn about a few of those today. Um, also, where do carnivorous plants come from? So, Lots of people always guess like Borneo or South America, some smart Alex guess like Venus, but carnivorous plants, the greatest diversity, the most different kinds of carnivorous plants actually come from the United States. If you were gonna draw a line from Eastern Texas to Virginia, the wetlands on the Southeast side of that line, mostly the Southern states, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Florida, Panhandle, those areas have lots and lots of carnivorous plants. You can find American pitcher plants there, sundews, Venus flytraps, butterworts, bladderworts. And then here in California, we have our own pitcher plant. Um, we have another butterwort. Um, so if you add up all the different kinds of carnivorous plants that actually grow in the US, we have the most different kinds. Kinds. Not the most species, but the most um, different kinds, most different genera. Anyways, um, so that's a little bit about where. Um, well, one of the things that's kind of a bummer is even though we had the most different kinds of carnivorous plants, we estimate that only 5% of the carnivorous plants that we started off with when European people got here are still left. Unfortunately, they grow in wetlands. So they grow in swamps and bogs and fens and places with really wet dirt and uh, mosquitoes and alligators. And European people, when we first got here, we definitely did not value that land. And so right away, we started building dams and ditches and 
and roads. And every time we built a ditch or drained a bog to get rid of mosquitoes and alligators and all those other things that we didn't like, we also got rid of all the carnivorous plants. Even the Venus flytraps are almost extinct in North Carolina and South Carolina where they grow. There's only about 30,000 Venus flytraps left in the wild, which there was millions before. Just 50 years ago, millions of Venus flytraps, and now they're almost all gone. That's why it's really important that we do what we do here. We spend so much time trying to educate people about carnivorous plants and how cool they are. And if you'd like to um, donate to, to a good place, there's the Saracenia, or the North American uh, Saracenia Conservancy is a good um, group to donate to. And also just the Nature Conservancy is a really great um, group to, to donate to. They buy up um, big chunks of land with special plants on it and protect them. Um, but yeah, we do our part here to try and protect them because they're almost all gone in the wild and they're still being destroyed almost every single day still. So that's the bummer part, but it is important to protect what little wildlands that we have left because there are magical things like this left over and they've been there for a really long time. We used to think about carnivorous plants as like the new hottest, like most exciting iPhone 12 of evolution in plants. They are eating, so they, and animals are like the coolest thing. So they must be like trying to be like animals, which means like the most recent kind of evolution. But that's actually not true. We now know that carnivory and plants evolved um, like 70 million years ago, which is a really long time ago. Um, that was when dinosaurs still ruled the earth. So there were carnivorous plants when there were dinosaurs, believe it or not. And they're actually mostly leftover plants that have been here for a really, really long time. Like Venus flytraps are native to North and South Carolina, and they've been there for millions of years. Even as the plates have shifted around, they've been there. Anyways, I think that's about everything there is to know about general stuff about carnivorous plants for right now. And again, if you guys have any questions, you can always type them in and we'll try to get them answered. But now I'm gonna move on to talking about uh, individual types of plants. And the first one I always start with because it's so familiar to everybody is the Venus flytrap. And I have a big giant bowl of Venus flytraps right here. Have you ever seen so many Venus flytraps in your entire life? So these are all modified leaves for catching bugs. Like I pointed out before, they do have flowers, although most people don't see them. Kind of white, boring flowers. And if you're growing a Venus flytrap at home, you usually recommend cutting the flowers off because um, you're probably not gonna get seeds. And if you do get seeds, it takes seven years to grow a Venus flytrap from seed to what I sell for $10. We do it a little faster here, but growing Venus flytrap from seeds is really hard. And it takes a lot of energy out of the plant. So we usually say cut the flower off so you get more traps. But I am making seeds here. So we've left all these flowers on and that's what those all are. There's only one species of Venus flytrap. And as I said a couple of times already, those don't come from Venus. They don't come from the Amazon. They come from North and South Carolina. Mostly a hundred mile radius around Wilmington is where the most of them are. Or were, I should say, as I just pointed out, since almost all of them are gone already. Um, and it's a funny thing because there's so many in hardware stores and we see them everywhere and we think, oh, surely these must be safe somewhere. But in the wild, they're actually not that safe. Um, if you go to our webpage, you'll see all kinds of different kinds of Venus flytraps, even though there's only one species. There's also only one species of dog, but we've made all the different kinds of dogs. And the same thing, um, if you go to our webpage, we have red ones and giant ones and ones with teeth instead of these eyelashes. And there's actually, we have um, like almost 150 different kinds of Venus flytraps just here. Uh, anyways, let's see. I'm trying to get it all set up so you can see one close. That one looks like it's pretty easy to see. So in order to make a Venus flytrap close, and they can only close about two or three times, you need to touch the trigger hairs. You might actually be able to see one in there. Um, maybe Google search a picture of a Venus flytrap. And if you look in there, you can see on either side of the leaf, on each of the lobe of the leaf, there are three little trigger hairs. And those are hidden inside. These are not the trigger hairs. They don't have anything to do with the closing of the trap, but the trigger hairs are inside. The, these hairs, um, the nectar that lures in the bugs is right on the inside of the lip there. And so those hairs 
keep the if you're a little fly face and you're trying to get to the nectar from the outside you can't really get through there and you have to come up through the middle where they want the bug to be then it touches those sugar hairs a couple times and the trap will snap shut we're going to do one right now you want to pay close attention sit up close it's going to be fast you don't want to miss it and i'm just going to use these tweezers to touch a couple trigger hairs let's see make sure i hit the right one i think that's that one there we go and it will close one two okay one more time there we go that one was a little wonky Usually they go a little faster than that. Let's see. I'm going to turn it. And we'll do this one right here. I think it's this one. No, nope, that one. That one. There we go. We'll do this one right here. I'm going to tear one, two. Oh, that was a good one. So those little eyelashes, they also help catch the bug. And so if it's like that, then they just close that far and the bug is already caught. And then it makes little holes in between to let small bugs out because the next step is um, it's going to press the leaf together and put acid in there and melt the bug um, to get all the fertilizer out. And that takes about 10 days. But they do have these little tiny holes that let the small bugs out because they don't want to waste all the energy of digesting a tiny, tiny bug. And there's these little gaps in between there and let small bugs out. But if it caught like a yellow jacket or something large, it's gonna hang on to that and spend 10 days putting acid in there until it's all gone. And just the um, exoskeleton, the uh, outside of the bug is left over. I don't know if you can see it, maybe I can get to turn, but there's actually an old fly exoskeleton in that trap right there. And it looks like the fly is still in there, but just the dried up outside is left. And all the soft parts that was the fly is all turned into fertilizer. And a lot of times a spider or a yellow jacket will come to that dead dried up bug thinking that's something to eat and it'll get, um, it'll get caught too. All right, so that's Venus fly traps. If you guys have any questions about those, shout them on out. The next thing we're gonna learn about are sticky sundews. So, let's see, this is a cape sundew here. Uh, this was my very first plant, was a cape sundew like this. If you guys are looking for a first plant, this is a really great one. You can grow on a sunny windowsill or outside in most of the country. Um, it's from South Africa. Although we do have sundews in the United States. This is a little um, round leaf sundew that comes from places like New Jersey. There are 200 different species of sundews. I just have a couple of them right here. But there are thread leaf sundews, fork leaf sundews, tiny, tiny pygmy sundews that never get bigger than a dime. But they all work the same way. They have these um, little tiny hairs all over the leaves with um, a gland at the end and there's a drop of glue. That little gland makes a drop of glue, a special glue called mucilage. And if you touch it, you can see it really hangs onto my finger. And if you're a little bug, you'll get stuck in there. And the glue isn't sticky like the floor of a movie theater or like pine pitch. It's just kind of like uh, wet sticky and they get stuck on there. And then all those little hairs can slowly move to push the bug to the center of the leaf. And then the whole leaf can slowly wrap around and hang onto it. It's not fast enough to see, but it does happen. So over the course of like three hours, if you come back, the whole leaf will be wrapped around the insect and it'll be putting acid on there and digesting the soft parts of the bug again and then sucking up all the parts. Somebody asked, um, are these plants photosynthetic? Yeah, so all carnivorous plants um, photosynthesize from the sun to make their sugars. So sundews, like I said, sundews come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. They also grow all over the entire world. The most kinds of the most uh, the places with the most sundews are like Australia has a lot of sundews, South Africa has a lot of sundews, and actually Brazil has a lot of sundews. But we have a couple sundews in California. There's at least uh, five sundews in the southeast. Um, there's even sundews in Alaska. There are sundews in Europe and Asia and Africa. There's sundews on every continent except for Antarctica.
Now, Charles Darwin was particularly fascinated with sundews. Most of you guys know, if you're old enough to know Charles Darwin, he was the guy who came up with natural selection as a mechanism for evolution and really popularized evolution with his book, The Origin of Species. But what lots of people don't know is he was also the first carnivorous plant expert. So when people first discovered carnivorous plants in like the 1700s, 1800s, um, nobody wanted to believe in them because it said in the Bible that man ate animals and animals ate plants and the other way around was blasphemy. Me. And back then there wasn't even a word for scientists. They were like natural philosophers and were actually deeply religious. Carlos Linnaeus, who came up with the entire scientific naming system. So all animals, plants, the mushrooms, bacteria all have a scientific uh, name, which is this fancy Latin name. He's the guy that came up with that system that we still use today. But when he got a letter um, from a friend with a drawing of a Venus flytrap and saying that he thought it was carnivorous. Uh, Linnaeus wrote back a letter using words like blasphemy and quoting the Bible because he just didn't want to believe that. And so Darwin, who had a very open mind and was fascinated with sundews, spent 20 years studying them carefully and doing experiments to prove that they did all the four things that I talked about in the beginning, that they lure on purpose, they catch things, they digest just like animals, and they actually eat, absorb all that fertilizer and it makes them grow faster. So he wrote a book, Insectivorous Plants, that was the first book on carnivorous plants that came out in the late 1800s that finally proved that there were carnivorous plants. Um, so he's also like the godfather of carnivorous plants. And he wrote, once wrote in a letter to a friend that he cared more for sundews than the origins of all the species on earth, which we tell almost everybody, because it's just so cool. Um, sundews have flowers too. There's a little uh, Cape Sundew pink flower that's going to open today. And then these guys actually make seeds. And you can grow Cape Sundew from seed in about a year. So they're pretty easy. Uh, one thing I should say about carnivorous plants is how to grow them. So American pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, and sticky sundews can actually grow outside in most parts of this country all year round. They're hardy down to 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can take the heat if you can keep them sitting in water. So most of them can take at least 100 degrees. Uh, if you get colder than 15 degrees Fahrenheit, you may need to bring some of them in and put them in like a cold garage to keep them from freezing really, really hard but they actually um, are much tougher than people think. And then they all need rainwater or distilled water only if you want to grow a carnivorous plant for a long time. That's because they evolved where there are no minerals in their water and their soil. Bogs and swamps are really, really pure. There's nothing in there for plants. And so they, um, they're really addicted to getting uh, very, very pure water. And so you have to keep them sitting we just have them, the whole pot sits in a couple inches of rainwater or distilled water, and that's how we uh, recreate a swamp. But they're actually pretty easy. You could totally do it. That's why I was able to do it when I was 11 and keep them my entire life, is mostly I just grew them outside, sitting in the water. And if you're someplace where you have summer rain, it's even easier because the rain is going to water it for you most days. Here in California, we don't get any rain from about now all the way to Halloween, so it's a little bit trickier. You just have to save some rainwater or maybe, you know, buy a little filter. That's, uh, that's how I take care of them, just real quick. At any rate, there's sundews, 200 different species. That's how they work. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and type them out. Another type of sticky plant that we're going to learn about is a sticky butterwort. So this is a butterwort here. I don't know if uh, this is so tiny. Yeah, you can see those little black spots on the leaves. Those are fungus gnats. Those are tiny little flies that get stuck on the leaves. They work just like a sundew, but they're, um, it's a little bit more delicate. It's a little bit tinier. So instead of having those big hairs, they have tiny, tiny layers that you probably can't see. Their Latin, their Latin name, uh, pinguicula, means little greasy one. And if you touch one, they are slimy. And you might even be able to see the little strands coming up off my finger there. So insects land on there, tiny things like fruit flies land on there, and they get stuck like these other little black dots have. And then they get digested with acid right there on the leaf. 
And we have a few questions. How many different types of plants are at the nursery? Thousands of different types. We have um, a fairly complete collection of species. And then we cross the species together to make hybrids and new types of things all the time. So we have thousands and thousands of plants here and we're making new ones all the time. How long have we been open? We've been open for 31 years now. We opened in 1989, which is about the same amount of time that I've been doing this actually. And have we ever done any museum exhibits? Yeah, actually we have. So here in San Francisco, we have this major, um, this conservatory of flowers. It's a giant Victorian greenhouse in Golden Gate Park. And we've done three major exhibits there. We've also helped to do um, exhibits at the like, uh, Missouri Botanical Garden, the U.S. Botanical Garden, all botanical gardens and zoos get their carnivorous plants from us actually for their displays. Um, but you can get your plants from us too, which is pretty cool. The San Diego Zoo gets your carnivorous plants from the same place that we do. Anyways, back to butterworts. Here's another kind of butterwort with really beautiful pink flowers. They're um, they're from Mexico mostly. There's, there are butterworts in the US um, and there are butterworts in Europe that look a little bit different than this, but the most different kinds of butterworts come from Mexico. Um, so their flowers are really beautiful and pink because they're hummingbird pollinated in the wild. So they catch bugs, but then they pollinate their flowers with hummingbirds. The hummingbirds see there and the flower and they stick their little beak in there to get to this straw of nectar that hangs off the back there. That's called a spur and it's all full of nectar. And that's how they make baby butterworts. Um, and they have the little sticky leaves. There's like uh, probably about a hundred different species of butterworts I think now. Again, there's still new ones being discovered all the time. And they're not related to sundews at all. They've just evolved to do the same, a very similar thing, um, but they're from two completely different plant families. So um, they're not related at all, which is kind of cool. So butterworts are related to a really weird little plant called a bladderwort. I know that's a funny name. Who would ever think a bladderwort would be a plant and not a disease, but actually it is. And they have beautiful little flowers like this. Um, and they trap things with heavily modified leaves underneath the soil that are microscopic, tiny, weird little suction leaves, which are so hard to see. We'll see if you can kind of, kind of get an idea of the size of them by looking here, but you might maybe, if the camera's good enough, see these little white threads. Those aren't roots, those are underground stems. And then there's these tiny, tiny little white spheres hanging off of there. Those are little hollow bladders and they're actually modified leaves. And if we were to blow one up with a microscope to see what it looks like, it would look like this. Oops, I don't know that. Like that. And they actually suck things up microscopic things up at one five thousandth of a second. It's one of the fastest things in nature and it's the smallest suction mechanism known to man. We can't make anything even close um, to that small and not powerful. And it sucks things up and then digests them inside these tiny bladder traps and they're really super complicated. But those are actually in the same family they're cousins to butterworts. There's 200 different species of bladderworts. They grow floating in water, they grow on tree branches, and they grow in all kinds of wet swamps all over um, the world. Again, there are bladderworts on every continent except for Antarctica. Somebody asked, can you use the plants in one in a kitchen to get rid of gnats? some flies. Yeah, that Cape Sundew I showed you, these guys eat lots of flies and are perfect for a sunny window still. Super easy to. And we sell them on our webpage for like 10 bucks. Okay, let's check out how we're doing on time. So those are our sticky plants. Those are bladder warts. And now we're going to talk about pitcher plants. So let's see here. Let me grab these. These are American pitcher plants, and they're really tall plants. These ones are about half as tall as they can be. They can be up to 43 inches tall, maybe even a little bit taller. 
Um, they all come from the United States, except for one species, which grows into uh, Canada. Um, and there are eight different species. Six of them are tall, like these ones. And two of them are short. We're going to see the short ones in a second here. But more typical ones are like this. They have this rain lid, like an umbrella, to keep the rainwater out of them. So they're called pitcher plants because they have a little spout on them too, like a pitcher of water. And so if their rain lid fails and they do fill up with rain like in a hurricane, they topple over and they can dump the water out and pop back up to catch bugs. Um, they have a sweet drugging nectar that the flies come to and eat and then they get drunk and they fall inside and they can't get out. You notice they're really, really colorful to attract the bugs too, on top of having the sweet nectar. Again, they do have flowers to make baby pitcher plants, and that's a flower right there. The flowers come up first in the spring, and then the pitchers, the traps, come up next so that they don't eat the bugs that pollinate them. Somebody asked, do any animals eat these plants? Not too many. Most of them are a little bit poisonous to keep the bugs from eating their way out. So slugs and snails don't eat them. Deer don't usually eat them. Sometimes a caterpillar will um, gnaw on them sometimes, but that's about it. So, the, um, these guys are the biggest catchers of bugs there are. They are the biggest pigs. They eat so much food. If we cut one open, they would be all full of bugs like that. You can see all the way to the base is completely full of bugs. And they're getting digested inside there with acid and broken down for all their fertilizer, just like the other bugs do. So there's the tall ones. And then there are also two species of carnivorous plant, of pitcher, American pitcher plant. They're low. One of them is this purple pitcher plant right here. So the purple pitcher plant, it grows, um, there's um, a bunch of them that grow down in like Alabama, Georgia, Florida panhandle. Um, there's a bunch that grow in North and South Carolina. They grow in New Jersey. And, and this is the northernmost form. This one starts in New, excuse me, this subspecies starts in New Jersey and grows all the way up to the Hudson Bay in Canada, east of the, uh, west of the Canadian Rockies, almost all the way to Alaska. So they can take it super, super cold. Somebody asks, how long can they live? Carnivorous plants don't really age the way the animals and people do. So they can live forever. That's why I still have all my same plants since I was a little boy. So those are 30 years old. We know of Venus flytraps in the wild that are over 100 years old. Um, and we have um, a few hybrids, a few plants that were made um, in Victorian times, in Victorian England. So we have plants here uh, from the late 1890s that we still have. Good question. So these guys don't have a rain lid and they just fill up with rainwater and the bugs drown inside, but basically they work the same way. Um, and they never get taller than this and they just make big clumps like cabbage actually. That's a purple pitcher plant. And then there's also this really weird looking parrot pitcher plant. Um, these grow down in the Florida panhandle a lot. Again, Alabama, Georgia. Um, all over the southeast and these ones actually float in the water a lot and their mouth to these is right right here underneath the little swollen head and sometimes fish like tiny minnows and pollywogs will swim into these pitchers and get stuck inside so you know we don't say insectivorous and that's on purpose because they actually catch um, sometimes pitcher plants can catch mice um, these guys can catch uh, little fish and pollywogs. They catch all kinds of things, not just insects. Somebody asked, can they die? Yep, carnivorous plants can die. Strong are they with the force, but not that strong. So all things can die. All living things can die. Um, that's why we have to take good care of them. Uh, but if we take good care of them, they can live forever. So that's American pitcher plants, basically. And now we're going to learn about this kind of pitcher plant. So these are sun pitchers from South America. They're a cousin of the American pitcher plants, but they come from South America. They come from uh, 
the Tapuis, mostly mostly in Brazil, but also Guiana, has these mountains called the Tapuis, which is kind of a silly word. If you guys saw the animated movie Up or have heard of The Lost World by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, um, both of those took place there. So at the end of Up, the old man flies away with balloons to this like far off mountains. Those were the Tapuis. And in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost World, he imagined this place where dinosaurs might still exist. And again, the Tapuis, because they're really isolated. They're out in the middle of nowhere. You have to take a helicopter all the way out there to get to them. And then they're like 3,000 foot tall flat um, mountains with cliffs all around. So you can't walk up them or even climb them. You have to have a helicopter drop you off on top of there. And they have been there for millions of years and trapped on top of there are these weird pitcher plants. Somebody asked, uh, how do you take care of these as house plants? Do they have similar requirements? Um, lots of our plants are outdoors. So American pitcher plants and Venus fly traps don't really make that great of house plants, honestly. If you have a really super hot, cooking and hot windowsill, you could grow them there possibly. Um, but they would still like to go outside for the winter in most places and get a little bit of cold on them. Um, however, the Mexican butterworts are perfect little sunny windowsill plants. Um, the Cape Sundew is a great sunny windowsill plant. And we're gonna learn about tropical pitcher plants at the end here. And those are also good uh, windowsill plants. They also, um, you know, normal house plants can take regular water. Mine all need um, distilled water or rainwater, and they usually need a little bit more sun than like um, a pothos would or something like that. Somebody noticed that these don't have a water flap, and that's totally true. That's because the Tipuis get so much rain. I used to live in Borneo on the equator in the jungle on the rainforest, and we would get 18 feet of rain every year, which is so much rain. That's as much as a two-story building almost. Um, but on the Tipuis, they get 50 feet of rain, as much as 90 feet of rain every single year, which is just constant rain. And so they gave up on the rain lid and they have a little nectar spoon, which keeps the nectar from being washed away. It's up underneath there. And the nectar lures in the bugs and they fall in and they can't get out. They also have a little hole halfway up that lets the water out without washing the bugs out. So the water, no matter how much it rains, is always at the right level there. These are really hard to grow for the most part because on the Tapuis, it's very cold. It never gets hot because it's so high up in the mountains. Even though it's in the tropics, it never gets hot. Maybe like 60 degrees would be a very warm day. And then it drops down at night to the high 30s or 40s, never freezing, but getting uh, really cold every single night. And they need that temperature shift all the time. So these sun pitchers are actually kind of tricky to grow. Okay, we're doing really good. Real quick, we're gonna learn about a California native, and this is called the cobra plant. It's another co cousin of the American pitcher plant. They're called cobra plants because they look like snakes. Again, bugs go inside and they can't get out. The opening is right behind this um, tongue appendage. And they have these clear light windows in the top that let the light shine right through. Let's see if we can show you here real quick. Maybe you can see the light shining through there. Mm, hard time getting it. Yeah, maybe you can a little bit, but the light shines right through those light windows and that tricks the bugs into going in and not out when they're trying to figure out how to go. <sighs> There's only one species of cobra plant and they only grow in California. And they've also only been in California for millions of years. Um, but they basically work the same way as a pitcher plant, and they can get about twice as tall as this in the wild. These are all last year's pitchers, and these are the new ones coming up. But that's our cobra plant. Also kind of tricky to grow because where they grow in the wild, the snow melts, where it's melting the snow and the high in the mountains here in California, keeps their roots cool at all times, but they need a lot of sun. So we have to grow them with lots of sun without ever letting them heat up, which makes them a little bit tricky to grow. And the last type of plant that we're going to learn about are tropical pitcher plants, which are all behind me here. I'm going to try and move the camera so we can look at them. Again, so these are not related to these other pitcher plants at all. They're in a completely different uh, family. 
And they're vining plants. So vines are plants that have long stems that go all throughout the um, jungle. So you can see these vines that clamber all over the place. And those can be 30 or 40 feet long. And then they have this long stem and then a vine for hanging the pitcher on. And then they have pitchers like these. Again, they have a rain lid to keep the rainwater out. They have this slippery lip. It's like a water slide. So when ants are walking on that lip and it's wet, they just slide right in there. There are 180 different species of tropical pitcher plants. There's a bunch of them here. There's a bunch of them all over here. There's a really pretty one there. Um, but they all work basically the same way. They fill up with acid and enzymes and the insects fall in there. That's all full of liquid that the plant puts in there. And they fall in there and drown. And then they get digested inside. Some of these can be really, really big. If you guys hold on just one second, I forgot to grab it. Let me just go grab it by the register. Thanks for waiting. Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is a really big old pitcher here. You can see how big this is. So this one actually caught a mouse this spring and digested it and even the bones. And after this, if you want to go to our YouTube channel, California Carnivores has its own YouTube channel. And you can see me dumping out what was left of the mouse after like a couple months of it being digested and most of the bones were even gone so this thing can even eat a mouse um they have upper and lower pitchers on the same plant so the plants down low on the vine will be um very colorful and big and those are more for catching crawling bugs. But then when they get high on the vine, they'll look completely different. And those will usually be more, like more narrow. And those are for catching um, flying bugs. So this is an upper picture here. And on the same plant, they will often look completely different. So you think there are two different species, but they're not. And those mostly come from uh, Indonesia, Borneo, the Philippines, Southeast Asia. That's where the most of these come from. Although there are two in Australia, two of Madagascar and one in India and some more far flung places. Some more questions out of the plants you're showing us, which are the most dangerous? Well, I don't know, they're all pretty safe for me. I've been doing this for 30 years and I still have all my fingers. None of them are dangerous to people, but um, dangerous if you're a bug, maybe if you're a little mouse. And then how do you grow the plants where we're at? If you're interested in learning exactly what we do, that book, The Savage Garden, tells us exactly what, tells us exactly what we do. But mostly we just grow them outside, sitting in a tray of rainwater or distilled water all year round. They can freeze solid, they can take the heat as long as you keep them sitting in that water all the time. All right, guys. Well, I think that's about all of our time. If you guys have any more questions about carnivorous plants, we are probably have another couple minutes to type them in. Otherwise, I think that's about it. Um, I hope you really super enjoyed learning about all these different kinds of wonderful plants. And again, if you want to order some at home, go to CaliforniaCarnivorous.com. I'm pretty much packing them all myself. Um, and you can find us on Instagram and on Facebook. We make lots and lots of videos there. So you can go check out all of our different videos there. Um, I just put up one on our Instagram about what is a carnivorous plant. And so if there's all kinds of things on there that you've seen here, um, if you want to learn more. Somebody asked, are there any plants that eat big animals? Well, yeah, well that pitcher plant can eat, um, well, nothing that eats like an elephant or a cow or anything, unless you want to do a lot of chopping. But uh, they can eat things as big as a rat or a bird, um, small mammals and birds like that, reptiles, frogs. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. And um, I hope you have a great day. Stay so safe and healthy out there. Bye.